So C Sharp is an evolving language. They, it's always been open source, but they pushed even more of .NET open source a few years ago. At, what's been like four years now? Somewhere around there. Longer than that, even. But yeah. Well, it's like the .NET Core stuff. Oh, Core. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, C Sharp has been open source basically since its inception. Uh, but since then, the, the community has really jumped on board with pushing in new features, and some of these were actually pull requests from community members that weren't on inside Microsoft. So they're they're going along, uh, but it means that they can push new language features out much more quickly, which means there's a lot more for us to be able to use and keep on top of for .NET users, specifically C Sharp. So the upcoming C Sharp 8, which we talked about, uh, .NET Core 3 is in preview 2. Studio 2019 is it April 9th officially releases? Second. April 2nd? Okay. I guess that was a week off. Um, so they will release the full C Sharp 8 language with Visual Studio 2019 and .NET Core 3. So once those hit, all the features we're going to cover today will be available. They are available today if you want to download preview versions of things. I have .NET Core 3 preview on here. I haven't noticed anything that doesn't work. Well, actually, that's not true. There is one feature that doesn't work, but aside from that, everything that I would do in a normal developer environment works perfectly. So you can preview them now. They're safe, and they work quite well. So some of the things we're going to cover, uh, and if you don't have any idea what these mean, that's fine. About half of them, I had no idea what they meant until I actually looked through and, oh, that makes sense. So recursive patterns, and we'll go over each of these in detail. Switch expressions, iAsync enumerable, value task, target typed or implicit new expressions, default invert interface members, nullable reference types, index and range, span and memory, records, pipelines, core three, and Blazor. We have actually had a previous email on Blazor uh, two months ago, mm -hmm. something like that, uh, two or three months ago. So you can find that. I'm sure our editor will be happy to link to the YouTube video when he posts this one. Does that one get posted yet? All right, so first up, after those, uh, recursive patterns. So it's more concise code with more powerful matching. Uh, is anybody, if you haven't used C Sharp, willing to bet that you probably also haven't done much functional programming? Say F Sharp, Pascal. OK, so you have some functional programmers. So you're probably then familiar SQL's with functional. SQL's declarative. Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. Pascal's not functional. Pascal. Oh, Pascal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> All right, so you're probably familiar then with pattern matching. Um, C Sharp introduced the idea of pattern matching with C Sharp 7. Uh, this is now a recursive version of that. So pattern matching, uh, it can make code more concise. And I've got some code examples I'll pull up in a minute. Easier to reason about. So without pattern matching, what you're going to typically have to do is a series of if-then steps. And say, if this thing is this type, then cast it to that type. Now get the values out of that type, on we go. Pattern matching allows us to actually check four things in the actual if statement or switch case <coughs> statements that say match if it's this type. And then if it is, do this stuff. So it makes your, your checking of types and checking of uh, values in those types much more concise, um, which is basically the next bullet point. So why recursive patterns? Well, with the typical patterns we've got from C Sharp 7, I can go in and I can say, all right, this method is going to take a plain object as its parameter, but or you know some base type. But I want to be able to check, all right, if it is this derived type, do this. Uh, if it's this derived type and this property on that derived type is true or false or some other value, then do this. Uh, the, the basic C Sharp patterns don't quite give us that much power to do. But the recursive patterns actually do, even so much that we can nest our pattern matching into child objects to really get the value that we want. And then once we've matched those cases, pull out the values that we care about to do work with. So bring this over onto the screen. I've got a few. So Nate and I split this up um, roughly in half on who presented what. So I've got my versions of my code examples here. Nate actually has them in the presentations. It'll probably be a little bit better, but 
um, we can come into here. So recursive patterns. I'm going to look at this. Okay. So inside my recursive patterns, I have my generic people list. Okay, just a, a list of users. Um, my users classes, or my person classes down here. So I have student, which is a person. I have a teacher, which is a person. I have a classroom, which has a teacher, okay, and a course number. Um, I figure most of us are familiar enough with classrooms. That's probably easy enough for us to get to. Um, and then I have, in my main, I'm going to go through and essentially print out every personal object that's generated. So I'm going to generate a list up here. I'm going to four over each one of those people and just call this method on each one. Um, then I'm going to create this classroom, and then we'll come back to the classroom stuff in a minute. So the old way of doing this in the C-sharp 7 version, I can say if P is student, so that's our first pattern matching, and then I can actually tell it ST, which will take and cast the P person as a student. So I can do that in one state. We get that from the, the basic C sharp seven stuff. Then I can check in here and say, all right, then st.graduated. If that's true, then we can move into here. And then I want to get the name and the GPA from that student. This is not bad by any means, right? C sharp seven gives a lot of power to pattern match on this. Um, so I can check to see that P is a student. I can check to see that yes, they graduated. If they did, print this out with those values. Otherwise, I'm doing similar things here with the teacher, checking to see that they're in a particular department. If neither of those match, then I just print out the same. There's nothing really interesting. <laughs> okay, the new way to do the same kind of stuff, and again, these are fairly contrived examples, so they're not super awesome. The classroom one's a little bit better. I can check and say, all right, if P is a student and if graduated on the student property or student object is true, then I want to get the name property and call it student name. And I want to get the GPA and call it GPA. So the new patterns allow me to not only do checking, but I can also pull values out of those sub-objects. So we'll see with the classroom where I've got some more sub-properties I can look at. But now I can just use student name and GPA as if they were declared properties and do that all in one line. Obviously, up above it was one line as well, but I had a couple more steps in the if statement. And anyway, same with teacher. Again, I can look to see if it's a teacher and if that teacher is from department one. Then get me the name, call it teacher name. Get me the rating for the teacher, call it rating. And then I can use whatever inside my statement. Question. <clears throat> can you use uh, type inference and avoid having to put the types in there? Or is it not working so that way? So just say P is in the curly brace? So where it says name, string, student name, could string ah. be omitted? Nope. Okay. String is part of the, the pattern matching. And the reason is if you don't have the type here, then it's going to consider it a condition, like the graduated true. Mm. Um, and it will try to compare name with the value of student name, which won't exist yet with a compile error. That's too bad, because sometimes those types could be kind of gnarly, and it would be nice to var past them. Uh, actually, no. I, okay, I mis misunderstood. Yeah, you should be able to use var, and that should be fine. Oh, all right. One oh. Yeah, so you can, you can do those. Um, again, because var is just a compiler trick that means replace it with the real thing. Actually, I don't know. Now it's saying that it's an object. Hmm. We'll have to put a pin in that question. Yeah, we'll come back to it. We can change it in a second. Um, let's see. Oh, that's unfortunate. The window has decided to shrink to an invisible size. One moment. <clears throat> Do we have technical difficulty music in the splash screen when we put these on YouTube? Yeah, two things. <laughs> <laughs> Too far. <laughs> Probably should have, uh, oops, gotten to this before, but it's fine. All right, and we are in recursive patterns. So 
Again, just from the console, I can use the .NET CLI, and I can just tell it to run. And that will run my recursive patterns. We get to see all the beautiful output. Which we get this. So if you remember from the first version, and actually, so right now I'm printing with the old edition. Um, we still get the same information, right? Nothing about this is any different. If I switch it out and do the new version, we'll get the randomly generated values, so we won't get the exact same output, but the same types of things, right? Um, nothing particularly interesting to say. We get a few of those. We get some Dr. Peterson, who, yes, is very awesome, although for some reason his rating Weber State was like two out of five. Oh, Dr. Peterson was the best. He was the most fantastic professor ever. Anyway. He, uh, uh, so the, the, the code up here, again, we get similar values, we get similar things, but again, we're still doing the same kinds of checking just with the newer C-sharp 8 features. It's not Brad Peterson. <laughs> Although if he ever gets a doctor, then it would be really hard to, we have to start saying Ron Peterson and Brad Peterson. Like Dr. Ron Peterson. That was oh. very specific. There you go. <laughs> All right, so let's look at the classroom. It's a bit more, again, because we have multiple layers, we can get into some more of the, the nitty-gritty. So I can create a classroom, which obviously is going to be type classroom. 42 ID number, okay. bueno. <laughs> um, so I can check to see that it is a classroom, which we know it will be, but again, contrived examples, which is what is right. But then I can, I can actually check to say, all right, check the teacher, make sure that the teacher's ID is 73. Then I want to get the teacher name, the teacher rating, and I want to get the CRN from the class. Okay, so without having to go in and check any of this, I can do an all-in-one statement. One of the benefits is I can see that the object is being created up here, but if I were in some sort of function, I wouldn't necessarily know whether or not teacher is no, right? So I would have to check to see, all right, if classroom is, or you know, the object is a classroom type, and if that classroom type's teacher property is not null, then go ahead and try to get all this stuff out. Now, the pattern matching will not only match on whether or not the teacher is null. If it's null, this is going to fail. Um, in which case, it just goes to the next statement. But if it isn't null, I can actually check again to see if it's 73, and then get values out of it all in one statement. Admittedly, it's not the prettiest of code that you would ever read. But you can do a lot with it and do a lot of different kind of checking as you go. Okay, so again, this is sort of how you would do it the old way. Um, obviously, you want to do something like c.teacher, null. Okay, and then, of course, you'd have to use the actual teacher property to get the values out, teacher name, and so on and so on. Okay, questions about recursive patterns? Yeah, I have one. Phil. Why is your VS Code displaying not Because. Because I'm awesome. Okay. Is that a plug in? No. Nope. I'm awesome? No. Nope. Okay. This is actually just a font. So there's a font called. Uh... <laughs> okay, you just went from I'm awesome to. <laughs> I was going to say, is, when this is why magicians don't reveal their. <laughs> that's <story>. right. Because <laughs> we're badass, that's why. <laughs> so it's just it's a font called Fira Code, and it just has ligatures in it. And they can apply the ligatures toward these. I still think I'm awesome for knowing what a ligature is. But I think I'm sorry I asked. You should be. <laughs> it's all your fault. All right. So, back to the presentation. Um, again, recursive patterns, they, uh, they give power. Everything we just saw, um, right, without any of the, the drawbacks of the previous version. Is there any limits to the Nope. Can we go down the child? Nope. I just didn't want to write that much code. Oh, right. totally, you can go as deep as you want. The only thing that I haven't seen uh, that would work well would be if you had a collection of objects. Obviously, if it's an array, you could array index into it and say if this array's index is zero, has this value, you can do something like that. But if it's just, say, an I enumerable, you can't say, like, I enumerable dot first from the link stuff and have that, that, that doesn't work. Um, you could check and say, like, if it's a, an I collection that has a link property, can check those as well, but actually indexing into the collection isn't something that is important. All 
All right, so next thing, switch expressions, like statements, but with expressions. And that's exactly what they are. Okay, so switch statements we've used since the days of C. Um, if you've done really any measure of programming, you almost had to have used switch statements. I don't know of any language that most people would learn as the first language that doesn't have switch statements. Uh, but for most languages that are C-based, you can only switch on the native types. So int, care, string, byte, and even string in a lot of languages isn't something you can switch on. Uh, it was only added to C sharp and what? C sharp seven. two. Was seven. It that late? Yeah, it was oh, late. I thought, I thought three had it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, Six or seven. Yeah. C plus plus. I don't know when it was added, but it was added a while later. Um, and that was even with you know care pointers and things like that. So it's still not quite the same thing. Uh, so switch expressions. Again, they're using pattern matching to do some of this same kind of stuff. We can do far more powerful switch expressions. Um, they can return values. They can do <coughs> processing work. They can do a bunch of stuff. I, we're just going to jump back into the code because it was by far the easiest way to demonstrate this. So I'm going to close our recursive patterns and go back into switch expressions. Oh, it doesn't look something. <laughs> the whole thing it looks like. <laughs> Object is not defined. Um, but it is. Yeah. All right. Anyway, we can we can look past that. So again, I'm having it generate this collection of OSs, and then I'm going to for each essentially over each of these OSs. My generate OSs is going to create something. I have this OS base class from which I can derive Windows, Mac OS, uh, Android, and iOS. Each of these, I can't get them all on the screen at the same time. You can see Windows has an NT version. Mac OS has a Unix system, which has a version. Android has a version and version name. iOS uses the same as the Mac OS. But each of them have a different way of representing the version. So you can imagine some collection of objects that you need data from. And each of those objects has the same kind of data. You just may need to compose it a little bit differently to get what your application needs. Switch statements make it, or switch expressions make it really, really easy to, in one very concise statement, say, Want switch on this, whatever version of the thing I've got, do this to give me the value back. So we look back up here at the code. <coughs> you can see I'm just, again, going over each one of these OSs, getting the current one, and saying, all right. Yeah, IntelliSense is going to bug me, bug me. So my OS is the current object that I'm switching over. And the syntax here is different from most switch statements, so it's a little bit harder to, to read. I'm going to make that bigger. Um, so I have OS, which is my object, and then the keyword switch. Okay, normally you would have switch and then parentheses and the value and then the curly braces. So it's a different setup, a different syntax. Um, then, though, I can say, all right, if my OS is a Windows object, call it W and then return W.NT version. If it's a Mac OS object, call it M and give me m.system.version. Okay. If it's an Android, call it A, and then I'm going to compose it by saying the version and the version name, so 9.0 and Pi. Um, iOS, same thing as Mac. Otherwise, I can use this underscore and say unknown. Um, this underscore is actually something new to C Sharp as well, where anytime you have a value that you just don't care about, in the past, you could label it as an underscore, and it's just kind of known among the developer community that that means I don't care about this. But that underscore would still be a valid identifier and still have a value. With C Sharp 8, and maybe C Sharp 7, I can't remember exactly when they introduced this, I can put an underscore in here, and C Sharp just knows, okay, delete. And it doesn't even compile it in. It just says, all right, give me the values out of it that I want, and everything else just doesn't exist anymore. I don't have to worry about creating extra names, uh, identifiers, I don't have to worry about creating memory if it's being copied somewhere, just gone. Um, so in that case, I can just completely ignore my OS object and then just return unknown. In this case, because it's just a you know, static string, it doesn't matter. But if I were doing some actual work in here, I could actually rely on the fact that underscore is an empty object. It has no identifier. It doesn't exist. So kind of neat there. Um, but again, from there, I can run 
you know, with my version and say, all right, this OS is version whatever. Question. <coughs> Thank you. So with the setup here, the Mac OS and the iOS just happen to be the exact same kind of expression. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to have, uh, you know, like in, in a regular switch statements, we could have multiple conditions and then one block of code. Is that possible? I don't believe so, but... Uh, and if so, would that be the syntax? <laughs> that's, that's the syntax that they use for the normal pattern matching. Okay. So I'm going to assume so. If this doesn't work, then we'll find out soon enough. And the compiler says no. Invalid expression term. So, no, um, but it is still a switch statement, so you could use follow through logic if you really wanted to. That kind of defeats the point of an expression. So you could put the two of them next to each other and then have just one? Yeah, but you couldn't use an expression to do that because an expression is you know, essentially okay. a statement that is on its own line. Right, okay. So, so no, there is not, not that. You can, it just defeats the purpose of using this. You're, you're essentially going backward. Okay, so again, we can see here that um, you know, everything works the way we expect. We have a whole bunch of different OS types. But again, because of pattern matching, we know that they're all going to work the way we expect and we get the values out of them that we care Okay, so these, these first few, there isn't a whole lot. It's, I mean, this is fantastic if you're ever using it, but it's not really that showy. As opposed to the next one you're going to show? The next one's very showy. <coughs> okay, so questions on switch expressions? So it's Our the same, same kind of expression that you had on the other stuff. other side, right? Yeah, it's doing the, I mean it's doing the same thing. If you were to look at the, the syntax tree that gets generated, it's the same. So we could even decompose it and stuff the same way. That I'm not certain of. Okay. I would imagine so, but I did not think to check. All right. So if it doesn't end up working, then no. Then blame Nate. Okay. Kind of my go-to anyway. <coughs> All right. So I async enumerable. Um, when Nate and I were divvying up who got which topics, there were two or three that we kind of both wanted, and we probably spent a good five minutes arguing over how we wanted to divide those up. Uh, this was one that he really, really wanted, and I'll be honest, I have no idea what it was. So I just kind of got it. All right. So you're saying you just wanted it because I wanted it? No, I knew it was a cool <laughs> one. I just didn't know why. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, it's an async enumerable. I kind of figured, all right, it's got to do something with an enumerable. It's async. Um, <laughs> it's the name, right? It says on the tin. Uh, JavaScript recently introduced something similar uh, where you can for each over something that is an asynchronous operation. So if you have a collection of something, then each one of those things in the collection are an async item that's running, you can for each over those and as they return, the for each loop will engage and work on it. So I assumed it was something like that, and it is somewhat similar, but it's not quite that. Um, so, allows for an asynchronous iteration of items, which that should be clear enough, right? You don't need any more explanation than that. Uh, but the meat of it is it allows devs to return pieces of data the instant they're ready. And we'll go over this with the code examples, but Typically, if I want to go out to, let's say, a database and say, give me all the users that match IDs in this collection that I'm giving you, I would have to wait for that service that's doing that to get all of the objects back that match those IDs and then return them as one chunk of objects. Okay, or if it's an API call or whatever it happens to be. With async enumerable, the instant the first one is ready to go, I can actually return that back to whoever's calling and say, okay, here's the first one. They can process it, they can work on that, do whatever they need to come back to me and say, okay, ready for the next one. And then I sit and wait and say, all right, ready for it. Okay, second one's ready, go. They do their processing, they do whatever they need to, come back, well, everyone's already here, go, and so on and so on and so on. So for anything that's a lot of data, it sort of acts like a stream or at least a publish subscribe. Not exactly, but that's kind of the way I can conceptualize it. Of Give me all this data, okay, here's the first one, do my stuff, here's the next one, So why use it? Um, again, we've gotten used to now in C-sharp the concept of async and await. 
like if a user interacts with something, I don't want to block the UI. I want to make my service call. The UI can continue to function, do what it needs to do, and my code can continue running. Bill has some more editing to do. <laughs> um, so with this, it's the same kind of thing. I don't want to have to make my user sit there and watch this loading screen with little spinners that we all hate for the two minutes that it takes to load this massive set of data. I can show the loading screen until the first one arrives, and then I can pop up the first one, pop up the second one, and as soon as they come in, they can keep coming in. So it allows us to have more responsive applications. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but every time I see that little spinner thing, I give it a 50-50 chance between whether or not it's actually waiting on something or whether or not the app has died. Stopped, yeah. <laughs> done something we don't want it to do. I have no idea. There's no way for me to know. As a user, though, I can actually see this. And even if I have like a transparent overlay with the spinner and I can see data loading in the background you know, on the UI, that's still a much better experience for me. Because I can see, yes, the app is doing something. I'm actually getting data loaded in. I can't interact with it yet because it's waiting to load all of it. But I have clear evidence that something is being loaded. So this allows us to do things like that uh, with very much simplicity. So where to use it? Um, again, asynchronous streams data coming from an asynchronous source, so databases, API calls, things like that. You can also use it to do events and messaging. Um, I don't recommend it because we have better patterns like the observer pattern that we can use for that, but I did at some point come up with an example for events and message messaging and then just deleted it because of, there's just don't do it. But you can, should you want to. Um, oh, yeah, one thing to point out, it's very, very handy for things like IoT devices, sensors. So, uh, you know, if you've come to Numug before, you're familiar with our uh, microelectronics stuff that we do. Um, especially at Halloween time, we built a lot of microelectronic control things. Uh, recently, I've been getting more into things like weather sensors, humidity sensors. And basically, all those microcontrollers do is just spam sensor readings all day long. Um, that way, you know the instant you're soil is too dry for the plants to be happy, you can have your sprinkler system kick on or whatever you have to do. Um, something like this works <coughs> well because you can <coughs> subscribe to that event and every time something gets posted, you now have your data, you can process on it and say, all right, it's less than 50, so turn on the sprinklers. All right, so uh, continuing on with async in the normal. Right in that window. Yeah. Screen, it's hard to see. All right, this one's a bit more involved. <coughs> Just because I wanted to make sure the basics were clear before we jumped into something more real world. <coughs> so, if we look at basics. I have a couple different ways we can do this. Um, first of all, the syntax is similar to what we've seen if you've used asynchronous calls with for each loops before. The old way would be to call whatever service, whatever method, but this is going to return a task. You can see it's in the task of I enumerable of date time. I need to await that task first. Once that await is done, then I can iterate over the enumerable, and off we go. Doing it this way is essentially no different than having some enumerable in memory that I'm just iterating over. It's just that I need to call the API for it. The new way is to say await for each, and then this new way method doesn't return an ienumerable that's wrapped in a task, it returns an iasync enumerable. And what that means is I'm not actually waiting for this method to complete before it returns. It means that this thing is going to immediately return with what is equivalent or analogous to a generator, and then that generator will be run through the for each loop, and the for each loop waits until the generator has something ready to produce. So if we look at the code, again, the old way, I'm just coming in here, creating a list of data, for reaching, you know, say I have to go out to some API to get the date time that I want. I'm going to simulate that by just having it delay for a second. And then I add it to my collection. When all of that is done, then I can return the data that the caller cares about. With the new way, Okay, again, notice the return types are different. We have a task of I enumerable of date time versus I async enumerable. Both of them are async, static async in this case, which don't make static properties on your services. 
or static methods. Um, what about parse? Can I make that static? No. <laughs> so <clears throat> down here, the difference is again, I'm just doing a for each loop, ten loops, right? I am as well, just delaying for a thousand milliseconds, so a full second. The difference is rather than adding it to a collection, I'm using the yield keyword. Has anybody had any familiarity with the yield keyword before? Okay, so essentially what the yield is intended to do is, let's say I have some method that needs to perform a series of steps. The first time I saw it is when we were working at PowerTech, and we have to program devices that then go talk to vehicles. Those programming steps have a series of steps that need to be executed in a specific order with specific timing. So rather than having to have you know, some weird data structure that says, all right, go out and do this, and then come back, and then figure out what to do next, and then run, we just put it all in one method. There's the entire programming for this device, for this particular set of this device. Here's where that entire program is, but I need to be able to do things in between, and so I can actually have a bit of this run then I can say yield return something. That'll kick it back to whoever is controlling the program, let it do whatever it needs to do to control the timing and whatever else it has to do, such as you know, run this step and then I gotta wait 500 milliseconds. Well, I don't wanna add task.delay in my program, I just wanna have the programming steps be the programming steps. But I can yield return and then whoever is doing the controlling can do the waits for me, which is what we did with PowerTech. In this case, I'm going to post the thread.sleep. Are you sure we had thread.sleeps in there or whatever? As I'm saying, rather than do that. Okay. We can, yeah. <coughs> so essentially what this is going to give me is rather than having to wait until... So again, maybe a better way of explaining this. Methods we're familiar with are typically call this method and it'll run to completion. Right? Whether that means it returns a task, which I then wait on, return the run to completion and then I continue or when I need some synchronous amount of data that I just wait on, that method goes from start to finish and then comes back. With yield, that's not the case. I run this method, it comes in here, does this first check for the for loop, comes in here for i equals zero, waits a thousand seconds or a thousand milliseconds, gets to this line here and then says okay, I'm done for now. It actually will return control back up here to my for each loop. My for each loop can then print out the data or do whatever other processing it needs. Then when it comes back in here to the next loop in the for each, it will jump back down to the method exactly where I left off. Continue here, in this case it's with a for loop, increment i by one, come in here, delay a thousand, yield, jump back up to the calling method, it's like returning the value 10 times. Basically, yeah. Okay, so if we see this run, okay, the first set is going to take a minute. We've got some errors. Start or some ways. We start the old way, so I've called my method. But now I have to sit here and wait for the full 10 seconds for it to generate all that data, and then it'll spit it back all out at once. The new way, as you can see, as soon as one is available, it spits it back up to the caller, and I can process it, I can work with it, do whatever I need to. When I'm done with that processing, I can go back into the loop, get the <coughs> process it, do whatever I need to. So my code is much more responsive, it's much more indicative that something is happening. Okay. The data isn't any different. You can see each piece of data for the new way is a second apart. Each piece of data for the old way is a second apart. They're exactly the same <coughs> data-wise. But as far as a performance uh, aspect goes to it, as far as making something that our users are more comfortable with, the new way allows us to process data much more easily. Also allocates less memory, you don't have to have them all at the same time. Right. <coughs> and it's also worth mentioning, the yield return is not new. What's new about it is that you can async it, right. which is really frustrating when you try and do that and it wasn't async before, and you're like, oh. <laughs> I'm sure that's happened to every one of us. Happened to me. You keep saying that, but you're the only person. All right. So a more real-world example, okay, returning date times isn't terribly interesting. This one still also isn't terribly interesting. Um, but it's a bit more like we would expect. So I have my red method. Okay, I have my API service. I've created my list of IDs. 
I want to go out to the API service and I want to load all the users that have these IDs and then work with them. Again, I'm just going to print out what those users are, but it could be that I want to take those users, I want to change something about the permissions, or I want to output something to the screen that says, yeah, this user has you know, these values. I can do that all here, and once I'm done with my processing, I can go back into the for each loop. Well, in this case, let's we'll do it all at once. But the new way, I can go back into the for each loop, grab the next one. Um, so these two are essentially the same thing as we saw with the basics, but using users instead of big times. So nothing terribly new there. Um, however, one way where this becomes far more useful is what happens if I have different <coughs> data sources from which I want to get my data. In this case, I'm loading users. What if I want to get users from my own local database or my API database? I want to then get all the users that have logged in with Facebook, and I want to get all the users that have logged in with Twitter. I want to process all of those because I want to send off some massive email to all of them for the next thing that Okay. The old way, I would give my service the IDs that I care about, and then I would have to wait for my service to load each one of those three pieces individually, aggregate all that into one collection, and then I can finally work with them. For API calls, as we know, networks are bad, they're going to be slow, cause problems, what have you, and they're going to be waiting for a while, and again, we're going to sit there seeing that spinning thing happen and not know if the app has crashed or is still processing. So the better way would be to use iSync are iAsync enumerable, in which case I can await each of these. And what this will do is say, okay, I'm going to go out and try to load the IDs from my local database. Load those in. When those are ready, I'm going to spit those back out. They can process them. Then I'm going to load the IDs from Facebook. Process those. Then from Twitter, process those. And I can process them in sets as they come back. And so again, I'm, I'm not getting any different data the difference is that here I have to wait for everything to come back. In this one, as each set comes back, I can process it as a set and then move on. However, the best way would be to say, okay, I want to come in here and do the same thing. I'm going to load my users from my local database first. Rather than returning them as a set, again, I'm going to await for reach on my users, and I can return each user as it's loaded. So from a user's perspective that's actually looking at our application, rather than seeing nothing, 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 bam, 30 different new users, or nothing, nothing, set of 10, nothing, nothing, set of 10, nothing, set of 10. Now I can just see load, 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 and the user doesn't care where they're coming from because they shouldn't have to, right? They can just get each individual piece as it comes in, they can see that it's loading, and everything is great. Uh, did I change that up here? Is it in the main? I believe you did change. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> we run this again. Again, we'll have to wait. We had warnings because I left stuff in there that I didn't. I copied and pasted, which I never copy paste. Okay, so you can see the old way for our users, we get all five users at once. The new way, we get one user as it comes in. The bad way, we're just going to sit here and wait. If I'm a user, go get myself a drink because I'm going to be a while. Okay. Um, once the data does finally load, however, I get all of it at once as one giant splat. Okay, better is going to take the first five users, spot them out, and I got to wait. The next five users, spit them out, and I got to wait. The next five users, which are the last five users, spit them out. Okay, the best way, however, you can see each user just gets loaded in as it's available. And yeah, our UI is telling them that this is from ours, this is from Facebook, this is from Twitter. But they ultimately don't care. Right? It's just user data that they want to look at. Isn't that getting more and more Nope. That's actually the opposite of what's happening. Actually, it's more efficient. So much more efficient. We mm -hmm. can show you down here what's happening. <laughs> That's the good part about it, actually, because otherwise you end up just blocking the threads, and you're holding onto that thread and it's doing nothing good. So you might as well let it go do something else and come back when it's ready. Okay. Yeah. So the key thing to remember is that this is only where we're working with our task system, right? So it's all going to be TPL. This load users is creating a task, which is essentially going to create a new thread to about reduce some work. 
while my main thread sits and waits. Okay, my main thread just sits there waiting for the spin. And every time this load user is called, it's going to wait, in this case, a second, a full second, but it could be however long. Even this background thread still has to wait for it. So I only have two threads that are just doing nothing but spinning as they wait. TPL is a little bit better because that thread can be recycled in the very cool one. But, yeah, the CPU is essentially just wasting time. Um, if I come down here, oh, that's that one. So here's load from all sources, right? Await, 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 and then finally concatenate. So this is this is the case where we have the thread just doing nothing for the full 30 seconds. The second one, I'm using the yield return, where I'm still awaiting for this one chunk of users, but once that's happened, this thing can you know back to the thread that it was on, and then return control here back to the main thread, do some processing work so the CPU is not sitting anymore. And then we can come back in, do the next step. This isn't a great example because the CPU still is going to wait every time I try to load this because it's the way I've set it up. You have to await and await and await. So you can't do anything until the next time through. So you're not really getting a whole lot of benefits. Um, it's the problem with contrived examples. Right? <laughs> um, the best version, again, I'm yield returning this load users async, which returns an iAsync enumerable. So in this case, every time that thing loads, it's going to load, spin back up to the main thread, come back down, ready, spin back up to the main thread. And again, because it's a contrived example, I'm waiting until the next piece before I continue on that thread. But in a real world example, you're not going to be doing any process, return, process. There's really no threads waiting. All the threads are always running something useful. Um, in the background on Windows, anyway, it's using something on called I.O. completion ports usually for something like this, which means the thread is completely free to go do other things, and it's just operating system is going to notify it back when there's something useful, interesting back on that we've asked it to wait for. So in, by doing this, what we allow it to do is <coughs> the CPU is always doing something helpful for the user rather than just waiting for data, waiting for I.O., waiting for whatever. So the TPL helps us out a lot that way. So, yeah, uh, really, anytime you need to have something that you can process as results come in, or you can process um, you know, so that you can show your users what's going on as it happens, things like that, I think numeral will be a fantastic choice. Questions? Other questions? Concerns? It's a good question. It's a good thought. Okay. We're going to transition to one of Nate's then. Hey, it's my turn. <laughs> okay. Make sure I'm on. Yeah. Yeah. So value task. <coughs> um, it turns out this isn't very helpful. So I'm going to go over this one really quick. Value task is simply a, so we see that we have the task of T's that we've been returning a lot. What's the matter? How really? serious? <laughs> the resolute, yeah. <laughs> Where to use it? The rather then. Did I use the wrong then? That that was your transformer text. Oh. Uh, I'm extremely disappointed with myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, value task. So. Uh, in TPL, we have this thing where we're returning the task of whatever type we want to return. That task object is a class, and it is actually allocated each time we uh, need to create something that's async. And that can be wasteful in some circumstances. The circumstance is, <coughs> um, well, I'll get to that in a sec. Um, here's the kind of the conditions for it. One, it's only meant for uh, native struct types. You would not use a value task of a reference type like string, for example. That wouldn't make any sense. Um, so this is for int, date, time, any of those, you know, native structure types. Um, I guess you could build your own struct too for it. Uh, it actually wraps task of t result. So um, the interesting thing is it has a task of t result and it has t result directly, and we'll I'll explain why in a second. And it's only used as a performance optimization in one case, and this is it right here, where 
<coughs> we have a method that returns something that could either be the value or it could be something that's asynchronous and uh, it's really frequent and we've found this to be based off of instrumentation to be slowing us down. So let me show you the, the one example. <coughs> so here we are, uh, public async value task of int. Uh, you can see that if uh, either one or two is less than one, then we're going to just return right away. There's nothing async what we've done. We're just going to return a value. Or if it's a value one is mod two, we're just going to return a value. We're not going to do anything async. Later on, we have these calls. In fact, let me see. I'm going to use your laser pointer. There we go. So we have these two calls here that are async, so that's, you know, justifies having uh, an async and a, a task of, of type. And then we're going to do some things with them and then return the result at the end. So the use case here is because sometimes we don't need a, f a full allocation of task, it could just have the value in here. Sometimes we are going to have a full allocate allocation of task, and so we'll have the task that we need to await. Um, and the trade-off is, while we don't have to uh, instantiate anything new in, in these cases where there is nothing, we don't actually need the task, value task itself is a slightly heavier object because it's got both the actual value and the, the task of the result. And that could be a problem. So what we're talking here is really micro-optimizations. The guidance on MSDN is basically only use this if you know really what you're doing and you have tested and you know that this is going to be something that's causing performance issues. But it would have to be something very niche. The only reason I think they actually created it is because they had a problem in the framework that required this kind of uh, optimization. So it's really not that um, not that useful for us day to day. But if you ever run across it, at least you could know what it is and, and why it's there. Um, but you probably shouldn't use it almost ever. So. That's that one. And then it's back to one of yours. <laughs> I guess I get the like second half and this is us feathering between the two. <laughs> okay, so, well, come back here. Target type slash implicit new expressions. How many of you hate typing the type of your objects every time you have to create one. I know I do. Okay. So, you sound like an infomercial. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm going for. So it basically allows you to create objects of a type when the type is already known. It's really, really that simple. So if we look at our code, laser pointer. It's cool. It is very handy. Type. There isn't actually a lot here to show. Um, so the uh, the array that I'm creating here, this point array, okay, it's obvious to the compiler that this is a point array because I've typed it as a point array. Right. Ignore the fact that for some reason my instance seems to be complaining about everything. <laughs> you only have 899 problems. I was wondering if someone was going to try that. <laughs> so rather than have to say, all right, I'm going to create a new point and put it in the array, and then another new point and put it in the array, and another new point and put it in the array, it knows it's a point array. So I can just say new, pass in the parameters of the constructor, and done. Okay, and then I can for each over each point in the point array, and point dot x, point dot y, and I'm done. My point class is down here. There wasn't a point class you could use? There was, but I didn't feel like bringing in the namespace in the library. Oh. Um, and it leads me to the first problem that I had with the preview 2. This doesn't work. Okay. And the reason I did the point is because this is actually an exact copy-paste of their blog entry that says, yeah, this is how you would use it. Copied and pasted it. So I think it gives me like a compilation error saying that you can't create a tuple without, oops, uh, having it define something. I can't remember. We'll find out here in a second. 
Tuple must contain at least two elements. What line? All of them. So it thinks those uh, eight and twos and whatever tuples? It thinks, it's a, it thinks it's a value tuple, which is what they introduced in C sharp six or seven. We had this discussion the other day. Yeah. So the syntax is what I'm referring to. Um, so C sharp six, and so it thinks that this is a tuple. And you can even see right there, predefined type value tuple. So I'm assuming that I'm missing a using statement because these are the using statements that they had. So except for I added task, because at one point I had this be async task name. Because it, that's just cool. Amen to that. So um, am I missing the point here though? Because But it does have one more element. Yeah, that's the other thing I couldn't figure out is it's, it's, it must have two elements. Well, I do. One, two. I mean, I'm no math major, but I can count that many. <laughs> you know what it is? Maybe. But I mean, it shouldn't be a member name. It's supposed to be the constructor arguments. Well, yeah, it's, it's so. not. I haven't tried that, but I suppose I could. It does not like this bottom line for whatever reason. Yeah, same errors. A for effort. So, <laughs> weird thing is invalid token in class structure interface member declaration. Point at. Some, something has gone so wrong that it doesn't even like this string interpolation. So I, I don't know what's going on with the compiler. Again, I just copied and pasted it in their blog because I couldn't get it to work on my own, and it doesn't even work on the blog. So I'm assuming this is something that is still broken in the preview, and it will be fixed when the final release comes out. Or it could be booted as a feature. However they do it. Um, this, this is the syntax that you would use for it. Um, I don't know how often I'm going to use this. This seems like the inverse of the there keyword, right? Because I could say, I can type that. There, not virtually. But because you declared it by type instead of varying it. it <laughs> no. So yeah, yeah. It, it seems like kind of the opposite, where I can do them up if I know the type, or I can use var and put the type there. It, just, it seems like they're giving us the ability to kind of put point one or the other. Yeah. I'm sure it would be useful here because I know I get sick of having to type in new and then some super long class name. I mean, usually I type the first three characters in the tab in Visual Studio if it's for me. But this this might be more beneficial. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this one, but it's there if we want it. Questions about implicit new slash target type stuff? Okay. Over here. So, next thing is default interface members. Um, like abstract classes, but with interfaces. Bring more C into C. -shock. So, what does it do? Uh, it gives us a way to add methods to an interface without breaking the original interface. So, say you have some interface that you've defined in a you know, version whatever of your code that you're using to define some service that you're running with. You then later decide, you know, it would be super nice if I could also have this other method. Um, going back to the user's example, I've used ad nauseum at this point. I have my load users, I have my add user, I have my delete user. I publish out my service. I have my implementation that uses that interface that <coughs> somebody else in the code team has implemented for me and I don't have to worry about it, but you know, now they're tied together because the implementer is a part of that interface, there's a contract there. I then decide, you know, it would be great if my API could provide something that was select users by some criteria. So I want to add that to my interface and we can do that, but if I do that, that's going to break the contract with the implementer and so they would have to rewrite their code and I can't have them do that for whatever reason. So a default implementation for interfaces gives us the ability to write that code 
without breaking the previous implementation. So we look at our code again. Again, there isn't a whole lot to see here. But program in the program, okay, I have my logger that I'm creating, and this iLogger interface has debug info and production. Okay. Typical <coughs> stuff the logger might have. Not really, but we're gonna pretend. Oh, and then this log method here. Okay, and these, of course, are just helper methods for this one. Is the intent. So I can use over here. I have my console logger that is going to implement that. So my console logger is going to have debug info production and log, right? And that's it. That's all my console logger has. So over here in my program, I can log this stuff out, and you know it'll do whatever it does. I then later decide it would be great if I could have this log exception method. Okay, and then even better if I could have this log with header method. Okay, but if I try to add those, I'm going to break the contract for my console logger. So previous versions of C Sharp, we can't do it. We just we're out of luck. We've got to make a new interface that then can add these things in and we can implement the new stuff, but we can't change the existing one without breaking things. In the new version, however, I can. So you can see here I'm creating a new console logger, but I'm using it as a logger, iLogger. So I can call this method again. Everything is broken for some reason in code right now. But I can call this, and what the runtime is going to do is try to find it on console logger. It's not going to be able to find it there, in which case it will then fall back to the next higher up thing, which in this case is iLogger, find that, hey, my interface actually has an implementation, and away we go. Okay, so in this case, um, this log exception, just two strings, the exception, then gives it a log level of debug, and then calls the existing method. But that's important because we need to have whatever special stuff my previous implementation is doing handle the same kind of thing here. Um, log with header, same kind of thing, right? I'm just creating this fancy header string um, the string that I, or sorry, line of lines and then my message. Again, I'm doing that by logging out the message and then passing level. So I'm using the implementation that console logger has. Um, well, yeah, so that's, that's the basic of how it works. So there are some gotchas, however. So we'll come back here to the PowerPoint. Okay, first of all, doesn't currently work. Could not get this to compile at all. Not even close. So it, it comes up and says interfaces cannot have implementations, which of course is the exact opposite <coughs> of what the system is supposed to do. So again, I'm going to assume that this is something that the full release will have, but the greedy just doesn't have it. Okay, the other problem is that of what C has, which is multiple inheritance. So let's say I have an interface A that has stuff in it. And I have an interface B that inherits from A, adds some more stuff in. An interface C that also inherits from A, adds some stuff in. So now I have B and C that both come from A. Then I have my implementation that implements both B and C. Right? Well, as far as my default or my regular implementations go, C sharp's not going to care because as long as I have the stuff from A in my implementation, then B and C are both satisfied. And if, however, I add a default implementation, in my whatever code is using it, I can say you know, interface A dot whatever default implementation. Well, is that then going to follow the chain and say, okay, implementer, look at B, then look at A? Or is it going to go implementer, look at C? Look at and what happens if B or C, one of those, overrides <coughs> my default implementation? Okay, so I have this chain problem that I don't know how it's going to resolve. It, uh, the, the runtime actually has a, a way around that. It will use the most local version and then stop. So if C or B have an override for it, it'll use that, ignore the one in A, and move on. If both B and C each have their own implementation, 
Um, when you define the implementation, so you're going to say console logger colon logger B logger C. <coughs> logger B is first. It's going to go to logger B and say that one has implementation. Use it. And just ignore the fact that C has one. So they've taken some paths to get around the problem that C++ has, where the compiler just kind of freaks out and says, oh, I don't want to do here. Um, and so we have a little bit better way of operating. The problem is, is that if you are using this code or if you are writing this code, you don't necessarily know where the default implementation is coming from. So there is a bit more work on our part to figure out, all right, this implementation doesn't have that. It's going to be the default implementation. Which default am I going to get? Generally, we're not going to have to worry here. But in the cases where that does become an issue for us, we're going to have to do some homework to figure out where in the tree our implementation is coming from. It's probably not a very common problem because <coughs> it's unlikely that two interfaces are going to have the same implementation unless everyone decides they want to do dispose as a default implementation member. <laughs> I bet the developers that created C++ said the same thing. Oh, come on. Also, they got around the deadly diamond. Yes, in a way. Also, the developers, there's the one. He has a name. <laughs> Anyway. Are you um, Bjorning over there? Are you Bjorning? Hey. <laughs> it's, it's now a standards driven language. It has been for a few years, so it's not just the one guy anymore. Yeah, kind of <laughs> anyway. <It's more> <laughs> so, so a couple of gotchas. Um, you'll have to wait till the full, ver full version comes out to actually try this. But once it does, like Nate said, you're day-to-day -day stuff that you're going to be writing, this, the gotchas here for the multiple characters will never be an issue. It's only going to be that one time where you're like, well, wait, this isn't what I expected. But you have to then go figure out how well that's going to be. Um, but again, for the most part, not, not an issue. So questions, concerns? Okay, Nate? Yay, I got the coolest one. This is the best one of the night. <sighs> Might as well just you know quit after this one because this one's so cool. Also because they didn't do the rest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is noble reference types. It allows reference type to contain a null. I was, I was waiting for someone to say, wait, what? <laughs> reference types already can contain like, null. Like, like yeah. Um, so uh, it's kind of interesting. I'm going to give you a little bit of history <laughs> here. Um, back in... 2004 or five, somewhere around there, uh, Microsoft actually tried creating an operating system based off of C Sharp, just kind of a research operating system. It was called Singularity. Singularity used a version of C Sharp that they specially doctored that so they could actually write C Sharp that would work in a kernel environment. Um, that was called Sing Sharp. And um, actually, there's Spec Sharp in there too, but the interesting idea the, is in Sing Sharp, they were trying to get rid of problems around nullability, um, and more on that in a second. And the way they did that is you could put an exclamation point after the type string, and that would basically mean that you're not allowed to pass null for the string. The string not, null is not allowed to be in this, as part of the string. <coughs> and ever since then, They've tried to put this in all the language editions since. And so it was a candidate for C Sharp language revision 4, 5, 6, 7, and finally 8, which is where it's probably going to actually make it in. Um, so let's talk for a second about nullability. So the ability for an object to be null was actually a language feature invented by a guy, and he calls it his billion dollar mistake. He says, the invention of null in 1968. At that time, I designed the first comprehensive type system w for references. And my goal is to ensure that the references should absolutely be safe with checking performed automatically by the compiler. But I couldn't resist the temptation to put in a null reference simply because it was such an easy feature to implement. This has led to innumerable errors, vulnerabilities, and system crashes, and it probably caused a billion dollars of pain of damage for the last 40 years. So I don't quite buy into that completely. Um, for one, what else would you have a nothing value be represented as? <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
excuse me, you kind of need the notion of nothing. I mean, if you have an array of, of a reference type, are you going to have to then allocate new types for each element in that array? I mean, th it doesn't quite add up. So I don't, I don't know if, if, if he didn't invent it, I'm sure somebody else would have. And I still think that knowable types have value. <coughs> but he's right. I mean, in general, no reference exceptions are thrown at a rate of four times of any other kind of exception. I mean, it's, it's obviously a big thing that we have to deal with. And uh, C Sharp, I think, has widely waited until they felt like they have the right approach. So one of the problems with the way it was written in C Sharp is uh, if you have string explanation mark point equals no, uh, you know, a non-knowable value, then what does it mean if you just say string equals? Does that mean string should be knowable? Does it mean not knowable? I mean, it kind of has some muddying the art of the nomenclature. Additionally, they wanted kind of some parity between knowable value types and knowable reference types. So actually, in the C-sharp specification, as it says here, the default uh, for reference types is to be not knowable. So uh, if you put just string there and not a question mark, string question mark, then it's going to assume that this is not a knowable string and we're not going to allow null to be in here. Um, more on that in a second. The, uh, this is a breaking change, obviously, and so you actually have to enable it as a switch in the compiler for C Sharp 8. Um, but when you do do that, it should help you, as you'll see, uh, avoid some of the null problems. Um, and it uses the same, same syntax as I mentioned, so string question mark value equals null. This is a nullable reference type. It's like it's a nullable uh, value type. So any questions so far? Okay, so let's look at some code. Um, so this is just declaring a nullable string, because remember, a non-nullable string is anything else without the question mark. Um, now if we omit the question mark and we try and assign null, we get this compiler warning, cannot, com well actually this is probably an error, cannot convert a non-nullable value to a nullable reference. So, no, you can't do that. This is, this type string is non-nullable, and here you are directly violating it, right? Okay, then we have a little bit more um, indirect view, uh, indirect type line of code, where we've got some method executing some code and it returns a value. Um, so we might get, in this case, a possible null reference assignment. Now I should say that the way it's doing this, this is more of a static analysis type feature for the language. And so it's actually kind of good at, it's doing it, operating <coughs> at the, the IL level, and it's going to go through all the libraries that we're using and it's going to do a pretty good job checking. And if they did a good job checking, then you're not going to get a lot of problems. If they didn't do a good job checking, you're going to get some problems. And uh, again, more on that in a minute. But um, so this, this example here, it may be able to completely look at this external library I don't have source for and may completely cr and correctly determine whether it's possible that this returns a null value or not and uh, the warning may or may not appear. There is uh, there is definitely some ways where it doesn't know, and so the static analysis is not perfect, but um, that's why it's, it's a warning. Um, here we are, uh, we're using value, and we didn't check, maybe up here, so after this warning, we didn't check to see if we had this value as null before accessing one of the properties. So we're getting, this is a third warning that comes with it. It's possible dereference of a null reference. Um, and it does go away if we do proper type checking. So if we do, uh, we just, just check to see if this was null and then wrote it out, we don't get this warning anymore. Or if we use the uh, question mark invoc invocation, then we don't get that anymore. Okay, so does this all make sense so far? <coughs> okay, so... Um, there are times when we have a noble string like text here and we want to convert that string as it were to a non noble or we, we know for sure that we know what we're doing and we are, want to avoid you know the warning of, of the past slide so here we have a, uh, a noble version of text right and somewhere in this dot 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 code we're sure the text is being assigned to value 
but the static analysis isn't for some reason or another. What we can do is we can use this exclamation point operator to say, yes, I am sure there's a value here. Give me the substring and don't complain, right? And it even works for the, the conversion. So here I am. <coughs> I've got text, which is a nullable string, and I've got text2, which is a non-nullable string. If I need to convert between them, then I'm going to need that operator as well. So that's kind of how that works. Any other que any questions? Yeah, that would be a null reference exception. Yeah, but you'd get it here rather than later on when, when you have text two. Yeah. Okay, so um, I can use it. So it <coughs> kind of comes cloudy. What what can, what types can I use? What types can I not? Um, I can use this code with uh, compiled things that are compiled within C sharp seven or lower. Uh, the problem is that we're likely to get a slew of warnings from any of those libraries that are compiled something with something with an earlier version of C sharp. I kind of worry that that's going to defeat a lot of the utility of the feature because typically people turn those kinds of warnings off if they get that volume of them. And it might be a library you don't have any source code to or any ability to affect. So it might be one of those problems where it gets better over time but it's not going to be useful at first. Or it may be one of those things where people ain't just going to use it because it's, there's too many Dagon errors. I hope it's not the latter because it really does uh, remove a whole class of errors, which is kind of nice. Um, so let's see. Eight noble types. Okay. Uh, can I use compiled? So if I use the C Sharp 8 class in C Sharp 7, obviously I can do that, but I don't get the noble checks. It's not doing anything to the code that's going to prohibit the use of it. In fact, the way it works is it's just adding an, <coughs> is that not my notes? I swear I put it in there. It's using a, an attribute that it's putting with the property or field or whatever declarations that basically says this is nullable. So uh, C Sharp 7 is just going to ignore the attribute, right? So it's not a big deal. Um, if it gets the other way around, then we have get the warnings. And then, oh, one more thing. Because... The, uh, the way of it's implemented is just an attribute on on those declarations. We cannot use it as operator overloading. So C Sharp can't tell the difference between a nullable string uh, with the function name index and a function named index with a non-nullable string. It can't tell the difference. So you can't use it as operator overloading. But otherwise, that's the only limitation. So yes, the, one of the cooler features coming out of C Sharp 8, and I got to do it. <laughs> Of course, you got the other cool one. Here you go. <laughs> Maybe we didn't divvy this up very fairly. <laughs> All right, index and range. Again, this one is very trivial. Um, index works just like you would expect it to. It's an index. So if you have something that is indexable, you can use an index instance, and you do that. Um, the benefit really comes in the power of rather than using, so let's say I have an you know, index, and I'm just going to say the index that you give me the third or the threeth element, so it's actually the fourth element. Um, that's great, but if I want to get the fourth from the end, then I have to say, all right, give me the length of the array minus the four. That's what I'm going to want. With index, though, I can just say, give me the fourth from the end. And it'll just um, with it, you also still get access protection, so you're not accidentally saying, hey, give me the 37th element of my 10 element array. Hey, that's going to throw an exception. Um, so real quick look at code, because that's it's simple. Well, let's do range real fast. Okay, so increase the subset. So if I have 10 things in an array, and I want numbers 2 through 7, then I can use a range object to get that. You know, in this case, four through ten. It's it's really as simple as that. Oops. All right. So index and range. Okay. So here I have my array of numbers. Right. I'm going to say my index on the 
the front side, I want to go to the two. So we'll get the two. Okay, then the back, so notice there's this little carrot here. Uh, that's going to say I want the fourth from the end. Um, the thing to remember with going from the end of an array is that it's not zero based at that point. So the front, I want the, the two element. Well, that's going to give me this one, even though that's the third element, because the from zero. Very well, familiar with that as programmers. Okay, this one is going to say, all right, I want the fourth from the end. So one, two, three, four. So if you want the end one, it's not caret zero, it's caret one. It's caret one. Okay, so going from the back, it's not zero in house. It's one based. So it's an affront to programming. <laughs> We'll get over it. <laughs> okay. Um, again, we can print those out, and you use them just like you normally would, right? So here's my numbers array. I get the square bracket. I get my index, closing bracket, numbers, square bracket, back, square bracket. So they don't work any differently than just using a plain int, you know, whatever you know, your index or operator overload has, um, other than that you can start from the back. Does it only work with ordinal index? Yeah, well you can give a 3.5 and expect something back? Well, like, you can index based off of type or something, I just wondered. Again, so whatever operator overload you have for your square brackets, it can work with those. But, you need to, anyway. So, your range, again, you say front, and then we have this new operator, which is the dot dot operator. I don't entirely know what they're calling it, but I think that's actually just the range operator. So, front to back. And that will give me a subset of the range. What is type of range then? Range. So. Oh, right, okay. So, yeah, a range is a range. So they've named them pretty appropriately. Um, but if we do index range, yeah. just a simple run. You need to oh. put your bar back. <laughs> right. No, that's why. I, I changed the wrong thing. My range would be... Yeah. Have all kinds of IDE range. fills today. Okay. Oh, I see. That's, that's my range. Okay. And I can say it here. Oh, yeah. So that should work. Well, it should work the way we expect with the range. Okay, so again, index and range, they do exactly what you expect them to do. Um, so in this case, my range is saying go from the element at index 2 until the fourth one from the back. Oh, yeah. So the third number is 2, the fourth from the end is 13, and then I get my numbers. So really nothing spectacular, except for using 1,000 times. Don't you have a comment? Types can you assign to index visualization? We've given it a literal int, and I don't know what type, caret 4 is, but can you assign a function? No. Uh, to my knowledge, the only thing that works right now is. So I tried creating my own class that had an indexer of type string. It didn't occur to me until just this moment that I could have used dictionary because I'm great at this. <laughs> um, and it, it didn't play nice with it, and I didn't want to spend any more time fiddling with something that probably wasn't going to work. Ooh, I have a question too. Yeah. Does it work with like long ranges, e.g., instead of int long? You know how sometimes you have like so I would length and long insane. length and. Sometimes if you're on 64-bit code, you index with the long instead of... Are you of saying I want to be able to do a long index? No. Where I'm saying instead of... Index is... That. Which is well outside the range of an index. Does it work? Well, it wouldn't because it's going to be outside the range of my array. But, but yeah, that would work. Theoretically. As as it, would, it should compile. 
that's interesting. In fact, I would expect this to give me an index out of range exception when I try to run it. Oh, nope. Apparently I'm wrong. It needs to be an int. It doesn't work with long. Which is probably fine because if you're using a real index, you have real data to back up. So I assume where you're using the indexes in the numbers array, you mm -hmm. could substitute the index symbol for the uh, literal carrot for instead of back. Oh, yeah. Sorry, what was your question? It's not listing the. Right. So ranges, just like they are when we say I want a random number between 0 and 5, that right-hand number is exclusive. So the first one's inclusive, the rest one's exclusive, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I would have forgotten to bring that up. So, yes, uh, as, we're, as we're seeing here, yeah, that 13th is start from this location and go up to that location. Yeah. So you can imagine it. In mathematical notation, it would look like the so mathematical notation you would get returns bracket front. I can't remember the symbol, but back and exclusive. So if you're familiar with mathematical, actually, I don't want to do that. It's a comma. So if you're, familiar, if you're familiar with mathematical notation, that's, <laughs> that's what we're doing. So I feel that you're giving our thoughts. Okay. You were doing this for like five minutes and then you resend it? <laughs> okay, so other questions? We'll see how far Nate got. <laughs> okay, so... Full disclosure here, span and memory uh, aren't necessarily new to C-sharp 8. In fact, you can use them now because technically they're just a NuGet package. But uh, they are coming to the framework as <coughs> part of 8. E.g., a lot of the framework calls are going to be using span and memory of T. So it's worth covering. Um, has anyone ever heard of them before? Okay. <coughs> so essentially a span just represents an arbitrary region of memory. It has to be a contiguous bit of memory f to be a span. So it has to be like an, an array, uh, probably almost always an array. Right? Uh, they're really fast performance because they're just as, just as fast as an indexer. Uh, they act similar to the array, but they, unlike uh, an array, it can point to managed or native memory, which is one of the reasons why you're going to start seeing it come from the framework a lot more is because sometimes framework deals with the native memory for us. Did you find another one? Greet for providing. Yeah. Man. Greet. Greet. That's, that's awesome. It's, like it's Latin. It's gratte. <laughs> <laughs> Except for, for Latin would be gray -off. <laughs> wow, we're just amazing here. <laughs> Amateur Listen, hour. We program computers. We don't worry about spelling. <laughs> the compiler is more. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's great for providing a view of an array. So what, why that's useful is you might have something in an array, but you want to return it, a bit of that to something else, but not have to redimension a new array, copy it over, and then return that. Or even worse is, you know, return the array and then say, oh, we'll stay in between these two ranges. Uh, so it's really kind of helpful for the framework to be able to, to help us work with it a little bit better. Um, so what's the difference between span and t and memory of t? Span is a value type, and the memory of t is a reference type. And so I've got a piece of code here, and we're using span of byte that we're passing in. And here we're awaiting something, and then we come back, oops, the stack is unwound, and therefore this isn't going to work the way we expect. Um, so, enter memory of byte for this one, and memory has is the same as span, except for it, it kind of has this span method to call span, but because it's a reference method, we don't have the stack problem. So even if the stack unwinds right here, 
uh, we can still do buffer.span0 and it keeps it there. So that's the only, well, only reason we have memories so we can you know, keep on referencing span. Now we'll, I'll get this in a minute, but there's other things that are variants of this. So for example, there's like read-only sequence and others that provide a view of memory um, that's a little bit different than span. Obviously here we can, this is mutable, read-only memories, uh, read-only sequences are not. Um, and sequences are a little bit different than spans, although they're accessed to much the same way. But um, let's get that in a minute. In the meantime, records. One of my other coolest favorite things. So records are lightweight classes. So they are classes that are only consist of properties, no, no implementation of your own. Um, they contain the absolute minimal amount of code. They all imp implement this I equatable of T and the equal equal operator. So we can do sameness checking. So if I create two records that have the same name and that only has you know the name fields, if I ask them if they're equal, it's going to say yes, like it should, right? Uh, it properly implements the get hash code for proper dictionary and hash table handling. We'll see that. It supports deconstruction for easily handling. Deconstruction itself might be something new, so we're going to cover that as well. And also export exec also supports expression syntax. Um, which is, I think, a little bit different than what Dan was explaining before, but we'll get to that. Okay, so <clears throat> first thing is we want to define a record or create a record. So this is the syntax for that. We just basically say public class, whatever, and then put our types and names. So string, name, date, time, created. So this creates just a really simple example of a class called example who has a property name and a property created. Here we're creating something a little bit more complex. We're creating a blog post class, and we're going to have a string slug, string title, string body, date time, date published, and that's all there is to these <coughs> records. They're just that. Under the hood, however, they're more analogous to this, and this is in two parts, but part the first is we have here, like we expected, I'm sorry, it's probably kind of small, but uh, we have the slug, we have the title, we have the body, each is properties, so we can get those back and published, here we go. Uh, we have our constructor where we accept the the, pro, uh, the properties and assign them to our properties. We have the overload for equals as promised, where we're returning that all of these things are equal. And I cut it off because it's not important to pass there. Uh, we also override the actual equals operator. So we, we do the right thing here. <coughs> we do a proper get hash code like as promised. So we can properly be indexed into hash tables. Um, and here we go, here's this deconstruct. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, but we, you see how we have this out string slug, out string title, out string body. We're just putting these properties from, from our class to these out parameters as in this deconstruct method. And lastly, we have this uh, blog post width. So this width is kind of an interesting thing, and we'll again see on how to use it on the next slide, but you can see all we're really doing is <clears throat> saying I have this property called slug, and I'm going to set it equal to this.slug, or my current instance slug. I have a property called title, and it's going to be going to default parameter to this.title. I have a property body, I'm going to default parameter to the body, yada, 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 and then we're just using the uh, Arrow syntax, what do we call that? We just call lambda, lambda syntax. syntax, okay. So we're just, this is lambda method, and we're just returning a new blog post with, you know, the same things that were passed in before, right? So here we go, here's, here's how we use it. So, I mean, I create a new blog post, and we knew it up just the way you would any ob other object, so it's nothing interesting there. Okay, here's my deconstruction example. So I'm what this is saying is I have a slug, title, body, and date published that I want to pull from blog post. You'll notice that this is, I don't know if you no, know, <laughs> this is uh, very similar to the tuple syntax in C Sharp because it's kind of borrowing and expanding the tuple syntax. And this is how we do deconstruction in C Sharp. So basically we have that deconstructor, oper uh, deconstructor method and this is the syntactic shader that makes it all work. So we grab the whatever values are in the blog post we had up here, and we're going to pull them out. We now have a string variable called slug, a string variable called title, a string variable called body, 
and a string variable called date published. Um, and then, as promised, we have that uh, expression method. So we're saying this new blog post is going to be this old blog post with, and we're setting uh, the very specific parameter to a new date time. This is date time not now or something like that. And what that's going to do is going to copy over all the other properties except for date publish, which I've provided a new value for. And then I'm going to get that as a new record called newer blog post. Okay. And uh, there is some syntactic sugar that we can apply where we can do the exact same thing, but instead of calling dot with, we just say with, and then we pass in the new parameters we want. So uh, we have a little bit of uh, syntactic sugar, as, as it were. So again, this may or may not make it into the language. <laughs> but in theory, if they do do it, this is how it will work. Any questions? Yes, Phil. Is the deconstruction based on member name or on the order of the deconstructor? Great question. Uh, I do believe that it is order. Member name. Member name. I was going to say member name. I second guessed myself. <laughs> you can. Let's see. Uh, Look at the. This is out, out, out. Again, it's based on the name, but you can put them out of order. Yeah. At least you could. Maybe this is different. I don't know. But, um, you can do the same thing with uh, arrays. And obviously, that's going to be order because. Zero, one, two, three. But with this, it should match all. In this case, they're the same, so I don't know. Pardon? No, the data types will be matching. He said string date published, but it's date time. Okay. So can you have nested types in here? So you have a blog post that's composed of a post, which is composed of. So long as the, there's a deconstruct for the nested type, then yes. Okay. Yeah. So essentially you can nest records and that's fine. Yep. Yeah, I mean, because records automatically support deconstruct, they're kind of neat to work with. So these are the new models for all of your model needs? That's right. One-stop shop. <laughs> Any other questions before we move on? OK. We're getting close, I promise. Uh, so system.io.pipelines. So this is something new that they've added. Uh, so let me give you a background. The reason f they created system.io pipelines is the developers of Kestrel, which is the <coughs> built-in uh, web server for ASP.NET Core, um, they needed more performance out of it because typically nowadays, since we don't really use IAS to actually do the uh, queries, Kestrel being slow has an impact on the whole system. So there's a group of people that are tasked with making Kestrel extremely fast. So they started to work on creating really high performant code uh, and they found that it was problematic. So the one biggest problem is there's just a lot of complexity once you get all the high performance concepts in one place. Um, and let me talk about some of the complexity here. So buffer issues. Um, my, I have a friend who works at Netflix and they actually did something they called the life of a byte. And so they tracked what happens from when you get in on the Netflix player the, the bit of buffer for the movie, clear until it's freed. So the whole lifespan of, of where that byte gets goes and copied and, and moved and things. <coughs> and the reason they did that is they wanted to see what was more the most efficient way to do um, this buffering and, and things that they, they do. So the interesting thing is large buffers have the advantage of they get filled up and there's higher you know max performance with the large buffer buffers right uh, you don't have to the blocked IO nearly as much and so you get large buffers much much more throughput with larger buffers the problem they have with the larger buffers is that 
you get over a certain size and those buffers get put in what's called the large object heap for the garbage collector. Large object heap is never collected and never compacted. There is no such thing as garbage collection in the large object heap. And so the problem is you get something you put in there and then let's say you're not quite it's, it be, might be fine if you're only using that one buffer ever. But let's say you're not quite done with that buffer and you need more. You allocate another big buffer and it goes into that same space and you might have this problem over and over and over again. So they actually opted for smaller buffers. <clears throat> the smaller buffer's advantage is that um, if it has a short enough lifespan, it can be Gen 0 garbage collected. And Gen 0 garbage collection is extremely fast. Half the time it takes place of you know popping the stack and then it's gone. Um, so, uh, and they're garbage collected regularly, and, and this pretty works pretty good at allocating and destroying them, and there's usually not a lot of problems there. But it is very wasteful. And uh, anyone who writes high-performance C-sharp code will tell you, try not to make a lot of garbage. It, cre it's, it can create some problems. So, I, I'm sure they evolved from, I mean, this was many years ago we had this conversation, but um, they, they opted for small buffers because they, the problem with the large buffers was too much. Um, but there is this kind of um, dichotomy because uh, on the one side, if you have a nice large buffer, you don't have to pause the network as often. But if you allocate a bunch of large buffers, you've got memory problems and um, it, it become, become real too much real fast. <coughs> so uh, and we'll get into kind of some solutions to that. But we had buffer issues and buffers issues are not easy to solve. Um, it's hard enough to, to get the, the data you want with just a fixed size buffer that you keep on reusing, let alone you know, worrying about more buffers, less buffers, increasing the size of buffers, copying things back and forth between the buffers. Buffers are a big problem in high performance code. Um, second problem is the data is very segmented. So, sorry, not data segmented. Segmented data problem. Okay, so what this is, is let's say you have a text based protocol like. They almost all are. So you're, we're talking like SMTP, FTP, HTTP. These are all text-based protocols, which means that we're waiting for like a control feed line feed, or at least a line feed, to indicate that, that we have a complete line and we can start processing on what that piece of the request means. Um, <clears throat> while it's very likely that the sender side of whatever this is is sending this message as, as an entire chunk, internet. Sometimes fragments packets, so you, they'll split one packet into two based off of the size of you know their MTU or whatever else. So just because you, you sent it out this way does not mean they're going to receive it that way is, is kind of the point. And it becomes kind of a complex problem to say, okay, I need to wait and keep on read until I find this character and then I can do some processing. But wait, I read a little bit more of the next thing. So now I've got to push it back on. It's kind of a pain. Uh, the next thing is flow control, which we'll talk about more in a, in a minute. But uh, next thing is to make this fully async on top of all these other considerations was is quite a thing. And in order to make it simple simple enough that it's really easy to read and understand what's happening, it was kind of a, a problem. So um, without prop pipelines, again, you have to handle buffer. There's also some coupling between producer and consumer, which you could probably do without. And you could maybe figure out a way to do it without, but usually there was. Uh, with pipelines, we get a managed buffer pool, which is kind of nice and built in. The built-in flow control, so we don't have to even worry about the flow control issues. Uh, and it automatically or easily deals with this fragmented data. So I'm going to show this. In the MSDN article, it shows this enormous piece of code, which is the equivalent of doing it without pipelines. And I'm not going to show that because there's really no value. Um, but even with the pipelines code, it's still long. But again, we get all these things that are, you know, it's more readable. We get to manage buffer. It's free. And even the, the, the example, the old way example, it didn't have all the cool features. It wasn't nearly as performant as the pipelines way. So <clears throat> you kind of keep that in mind if you ever go look up the original article on this. So the first thing we're going to look at here is the process line. So what this is going to do is we're going to take in a socket in this case, a network socket, and we're going to allocate a new pipe, and we're going to say the reading task is going to be fulfilled by this fill pipe async 
where we're passing the socket and the pipe writer. And the reading is going to be with this read pipe async where we pass in the pipe reader. And when we're done reading and writing, we can return from this app. Okay, pretty simple there. This one's a little longer, and I'm sorry, it's going to be kind of small. Um, I wanted to get the whole function kind of, at least this part of it, <laughs> in one thing. Uh, and this one, so this is the fill pipe async from, from over here. So we've got this fill pipe async, right? And we're passing in our socket, and we're passing in the pipe writer. And uh, we are going to start out by <coughs> getting a memory of byte, and this is going to act as our buffer. We do that by doing this writer.getMemory. So this is essentially a buffer pool. And we'll talk a little bit more about how the buffer pool works. But essentially, it's going to make, it's going to have a lot of little buffers underneath the hood. But it's going to make them look like and feel like to us, like it's all just one big buffer. So we kind of get the advantages of, of acting like it's one big buffer. But we get the, also get the advantages of uh, we can free bits of this and it actually goes away and it's not nothing's in large object object heap. So we're gonna tell it we want at least a, a 512 buffer size here. Okay, and then this part should look familiar. We're just gonna await the socket receive async. And so we're gonna get something back from our socket, hopefully. If we got bytes back, if we got bytes back of zero, that means the socket's probably closed. But if we get bytes back, then we're going to tell the writer to advance by this many bytes. And it's going to automatically allow uh, the buffer to, to move or increment forward automatically for us. We have to worry about that. And then, you know, catch thing. I wish I had just taken that out. But uh, then when we feel like we've gotten everything we need, we do this flush async. This writer flush async allows that bit of data to be read by the reader, which we'll see in a second. We'll see the other half of this in a second. And... So long as that result's complete, completed, we can move on. This result completed, uh, you know, I was talking about like the text-based protocols and how they might have been chunked up. And so we may not get a full command in any one read. Uh, this is allows the reader to tell us the, sorry, the, yes, that's the writer because we're writing on the side of the pipe. Yeah, allows, allows the reader to tell us uh, from the writer side of the pipe because we're a writer here that uh, yes, we've got the full command, and we're done. Okay, so here's the other side of it. This is the read pipe async. So uh, this is going to start out by waiting for something that has been flushed. So once we call this flush async, that's when this returns a result. We're going to grab the buffer back as a read-only sequence of byte, and we're going to look through this uh, buffer and, and look for uh, essentially that we have the whole command, right? Uh, there's some interesting bits here, like buffer slice, which is uh, just going to give us a, a view of the buffer. A buffer slice is going to return a span of data that we can process later. Again, we'll see the this uh, process line in a minute. And then we're going to tell the buffer, we basically, we're done with this amount of the data. But we're going to leave some data in there, potentially, for the next read through this thing. Uh, because we might have another process line we needed to uh, to read through here. And so we do that until we're, we're done, essentially. Then we advance to basically saying we're done with this part. This advance to is going to tell the buffer pool, we're done with all this with the, all this other data, so go ahead and reallocate it. Once we call this events to, we can't go back to any of that data. It's not no longer ours, so we need to watch out for that. But uh, it basically says go ahead and reuse these buffers. Uh, and then if we're completed, then we're done. So one last here. So uh, in this one, this is just a really simple example. We're just going to say, that, yep, we're done. <laughs> but it could be more complex than that. Our, uh, our pipeline read line could be a lot more complex than just you know saying it's done. Uh, but in this case, it's really simple. Okay. So read-only sequence is interesting. So it's obviously a sequence and not a span. Remember, a span can only be a contiguous block of memory. A sequence has no limitation like that, but it does operate a lot like the span. Under the hood, we've got these buffers over here, and the read-only sequence is going to start maybe at, in the middle of this buffer. It's going to be in this entire other buffer and just one bit of this other buffer. 
But to us, it's going to look like it's just one bit of memory thanks to this read-only sequence here. Um, so any questions on that? Okay. Flow control. So uh, flow control is one of those things that it's giving us automatically. This is a really important uh, notion because in an ideal world, your producer and consumer are going to be 100% busy all the time at equal levels and will never have to wait on each other. In the real life, though, <laughs> we either sometimes have a faster producer or we sometimes have a faster consumer. But either way, we have to worry about the right time to process things and things like that. So the flow control is handled by two knobs, basically. So we have this resume writer threshold and this pause writer threshold. So that's to say, let's say we're reading in this buffer and we get to this pause writer threshold right here. We still have a little bit of buffer left, but we don't want to read anymore at the moment. So we're going to wait until some of this stuff is processed. So some of it's going to be processed, maybe, so maybe this is processed, maybe this is processed. Once we get below this resume writer threshold, it will then unpause the producer and we'll you know, read it back up. Now this is uh, particularly important to have two of these, not just a pause writer threshold, because we can, uh, there's something called thrashing, where we, we continually read and then pause and read and then pause and read and pause, which is really harmful for I.O. So we want to avoid the thrashing, and we do that with those two knobs being set appropriately. And the defaults for these seem to be pretty good. So um, the only thing is, I think the, the buffer pool, by default, uh, doesn't allow, uh, I, I already usually increase it, maybe by a factor of three or something, but um, that's kind of how it works. So any questions there? Uh, this is how I use the code, and like I said, this is this is still kind of a lot. But the the takeaways here are that I've got a pipe. It's got a reading task and writing task, and I, I can read with the reading task. And when I've read some stuff, I would call flush, and if the result is complete, then it's going to tell me. And on this side of things, we're going to take what was read and we're going to process it, and when I'm done with bits of it, I'm going to call advance two, and it's going to allow it to be done. And that there's a reader complete for whatever's processing. Those are the bits to pull out of here. I really should have gone through and simplified this code a little bit. Uh, for example, I could have taken out the try catch, but they're just, it's trying to make it analogous to what the code that was there before, and it kind of does need to be here. Um, when you're re receiving from a socket, sometimes you kind of get hung up on that does throw an exception. You need to have a, a try catch. So I, I understand why it's this many pieces to use it, but just keep in mind it's about twice as many pe pieces to do it incorrectly <laughs> and not as performance. So, okay. Okay, yeah, so here we go. Uh, they are. Uh, part of the pipe. So there's a resume writer threshold and a pause writer threshold as part of the pipe. So back here on this slide here, if I do pipe dot resume writer threshold, I would do that here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about any framework for just a second. This is just a really brief slide. Uh, any framework core three is also slated to come out and it is going to support dot .NET, sorry, C sharp eight. Um, the main new features for Entity Framework Core 3, one is that it works better. So better testability, better SQL generation, more efficient SQL queries, etc. Another cool one is no SQL support. So we're going to have, you know, like MongoDB or Cosmos DB. I think they might actually only be supporting Cosmos DB out the gate, but the fact that they have that support means it can be ported elsewhere. Um, it's going to be C Sharp 8 compliant, so there's the noble reference types and async streams that we talked about. Uh, better support for views. Uh, in core, we have had less support than in the full framework. And again, this is another thing in, in the core we had less than in the real framework. But in the real framework, many to many mapping tables were invisible. Uh, you didn't have to see them in your models. 
Uh, and if core is finally going to get that as a feature. So that's kind of neat. Questions on EF core? That's the only side after it. Uh, probably not. This will probably lag behind a ways because uh, it's going to support C sharp eight. C sharp eight isn't fully shipped, so no, I don't think so. Um, Blazor in beta now. We did a new node presentation not a couple months ago. Hopefully, be on the YouTube channel about when before it actually ships. Or? <laughs> we just released Visual Studio 2017. I'll release, last week, so. I'll release a video on everything I have all the media for. Does that, does that include Blazor? I don't know. <laughs> I think we found the, uh, the AN. Yeah, I think so too. I think so. Um, but if you haven't ever heard of Blazor or looked at Blazor, it's really cool. It basically allows you to put C Sharp in the web. When I say that, like running on the web browser, it compiles it to WebAssembly essentially, and then runs there. So you can actually do model binding with types actually declared in the browser, on the browser, all through the browser. It's really cool. Um, see other published works. <laughs> Any questions on that? Okay. So that's all we've got. That's the end. And it only took an hour and 25 minutes. <laughs>